assure that shooters understand all aspects of takeoff, only aviators hold this job. Thumbs thumbs, head still steady. See a pilot may spend an entire tour as a shooter. Good shot. Landing and takeoff are tough on airframes, engines, and other critical parts. Maintenance is essential. Air wing crews often make repairs on the spot. Serious problems go into the main hangar. The four aircraft elevators can haul 50 tons of warplane to or from the hangar deck in eight seconds. A cavernous 25 feet high, the main hangar is nearly 700 feet long and more than 100 feet wide. It's a warehouse for the tools of war, and when those tools break down, it's a repair shop. Green-shirted crews handle the work on planes parked wing to wing. George Washington's mechanics can handle 95% of warplane repairs on board. Their spare parts inventory is right at hand. The aft portion of the hangar is reserved for jet engine repair, performed by the Aircraft Intermediate Maintenance Division, or AIMD. Right now we're back here in the jet shop where I've got about 40 people that do work on the various engines that we have the capability to repair. For the most part, the squadrons can only do on-aircraft work on the engines. Anything that goes beyond their capability on the aircraft, the engine's got to be pulled out and then it's brought back here for that type of work. In a war zone, maintenance crews work around the clock. A carrier is essentially a medium-sized town that roams the sea. Her more than 5,000 citizens eat every meal out in any of many mess decks. The constant rotation of breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mid-rats, or midnight rations, keeps galley crews busy night and day. As in any town, a carrier's residence can spend months, even years, aboard without seeing her every corner. George Washington is honeycombed with nearly five miles of passageways and thousands of watertight doors. Some doors are open only to a select few. Aboard a Nimitz-class carrier, the Combat Direction Center is one of the quietest, most secure locations. Here, science and warfare overlap. In real time, computer and video screens deliver key data from around the world, including battlefields. CDC sailors can see aircraft and other vessels and bring up displays showing their points of view in seconds, discerning friend from foe. OK, uh, just give me another call real quick. Lieutenant Commander John Dotka is the officer in charge. I'm the air defense officer on board the ship, and I'm one of the ship's four tactical action officers. We have various consoles everywhere. The first console you see there is our strike controller. He's going to go out, and he's going to be the first person that talks to our aircraft as they take off and go out to, to do their mission. He's also going to be the first person they talk to when they come back. So if we send out 20 airplanes, we want to make sure we have 20 airplanes coming back and not 21. The center camera is, a, uh, is what we call our plat, or our precision landing, which helps us see what's going on on the flight deck itself. And it gives us overall situational awareness of anything that happens. If there's a major fire or something like that, we'll see that and, and we'll kind of be able to see outside how things are going because obviously it stays, uh, stays pretty dark and quiet in here. Combat Direction's 80 crew members work with deep concentration, analyzing and distributing top secret information to pilots and the bridge. Copy. Have record news. This is one of the carrier's nerve centers but a nerve center with mood lighting and an ambience like a reference library. 
As things heat up, it becomes very quiet and it's very dark. We usually have the lights all the way down. And our job is to keep the situation calm and controlled and to make sure that, that we follow the procedures and we go through things by the book. So as things escalate, you would hope, and, and what, we, what we train to, is that the, the tempo here comes out the exact same. A carrier's main shield is her planes, which can bring their armaments to bear on attackers. The second line of defense, batteries of Sea Sparrow missiles. Nimitz-class carriers have three Sea Sparrow batteries, two aft and one forward. Each carries eight missiles, able to lock onto and bring down a plane or cruise missile within nine miles of the ship. When the target gets in close enough, our launcher will slew out to, uh, towards the target, and uh, I will fire, I'll push the button here, and I'll fire however many salvos I need to. I can fire uh, eight missiles in 40 seconds. If, during an enemy assault, all else fails, the crew can deploy an update of a 19th century weapon, Gatling guns. These six-barreled radar-controlled arrays are called close-in weapon systems, SeaWiz for short. Each corner of the ship has a SeaWiz battery. Cannoneers can focus bursts of 20 millimeter fire at the rate of 3,000 rounds per minute, literally filling a selected patch of sky with metal and high explosive. SeaWiz is a close in weapon system, that's what it stands for. It is our last line of defense. When there is an incoming target, it's coming in, it's going to pick up the closest point of approach. Now, on a missile, it's going to be the front part of it. Well, the idea behind SeaWiz is to take the warhead out. If you take the warhead out, you don't have to worry about it blowing up. The gun is going to slew back and forth to the closest point, and it's going to start eating it up from the front back. As many rounds as it can, it's going to put as many rounds on, the, on that middle target as it can. The single biggest commodity on board George Washington is JP-5 aviation fuel. The carrier hauls 2.4 million gallons of the stuff, stored in tanks below the waterline. The highly volatile fuel sees double duty as ballast, literally keeping the carrier on an even keel. Warplanes can burn 20 gallons of fuel in a single second. So while at sea, Carriers like GW must take on jet fuel every few days. To connect with a refueling vessel, sailors shoot lines that they use to pull fuel hoses into place. Buffeted by one another's wakes, the vessels have to keep on course or risk disaster. With so much fuel on hand, fire safety is a primary concern. Throughout the deployment, the carrier's crew trains to fight fires. Right now, the firefighting team is getting all the gear they need, getting manned and ready to go ahead up to the space and enter the, uh, enter the space to fight the fire. Let's go! I need some smoke taken out! Let's go! Get up there right now! Get up there! Damage control teams drill under conditions as close to the real thing as possible with artificial smoke billowing and alarm sounding. Because few calamities can play as much havoc with a ship as fire, every single crew member must be certified to fight flames. Exercises like this one keep emergency response skills crisp.